Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Coffee with Tea and I'm Tea. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Happy Monday. Happy belated Father's Day to all the fathers, all the uncles, all the grandfathers, all the men who step in the daddy role when the daddy's not there. Happy Father's Day. Hope you had a blessed weekend. I'm so excited today. I have a very special guest. If you just if this is your first time tuning in, you know that on Monday, now you're going to learn that Monday's on Man Combo Monday, where we have a man come on and speak his truth from his perspective, his education, uh, his experiences, his experience with other men. And I just ask some real questions and I let him lead the conversation so that I can learn. And during my process of learning from a lot of Black men in my life and just listening, I just wanted to share a platform where my sisters could listen. So... Today we have with us, let me just get his bio. Oh, Jay you don't have to read that. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to let you tell you. I'm going to let you that. See? So I'm going to plan that too. Hold on, no, start I'm, today. I'm, I'm, it's too I'm early to for that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm messing with you. No, I love a leader, but from the classroom to the boardroom, family therapist and mental health coach Jay Barnett empowers corporate clients and individuals while also inspiring youth across the nation as an author and speaker. Through his new venture, Kindling Innovation Necessary for Growth King, Jay offers individual and group coaching sessions online, which are designed to help create healthy patterns of thinking and set measurable goals for work or personal life. Through the corporate wellness program, Jay empowers employees to focus on holistic well-being to create a culture of teamwork. I got the short one, see? I no. got the short one. I the short one. No. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, Jay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to have you here. So I got questions. So I usually get right into it because I yeah. don't like to take too long to get into the conversation. So our topic today, this uh, this week is are black men mentally unstable to love and are black women driving them crazy? And the first thing that I always do when I have my men come on is ask them a little bit about their background so I can get a feel and people around can get a feel that you're human. So tell us a little bit about how you grew up about your mom and your dad and how, what kind of influence they had on your life. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up, my dad's a pastor. Uh, I grew up in Mississippi. Um, and uh, my parents were married 15 years before they divorced. Uh, before they divorced, uh, they, they, they divorced when I was 13 years old. So uh, my mom moved us from uh, Mississippi to Texas. And so um, it's kind of like when I really uh, started experiencing my challenges as a teenager, where they kind of started probably like around six or seven grade because that's by the time my parents' marriage was kind of unraveling and I just started acting out um, because I could see, you know, uh, my father was less and uh, less and less at home. Wow. And, um, and I remember walking in on my mom one night crying and just asking her why was she crying and just, you know, talking about, uh, you know, she, you know, was just hurt from, you know, the things that were going on between her and my dad. And so I think, uh, during that time was really the first time that I actually saw my mom, uh, you know, I don't want to say weak, but, but just saw her in a moment of weakness. Right. And so, yeah. uh, because my mom is a very, very strong woman. And, uh, and so I, I just, you know, never seen her crying, you know what I mean? Um, you know, in that manner. And so I think that had an impact on me that had an impact on just kind of like even the light that I saw my father in during that time and um, kind of right. built up some, some some resentment and some bitterness and, and things of that nature. And uh, so those were the things that kind of shaped me, you know, uh, into, you know, looking toward football as just kind of being my coping um, mechanism and, and, uh, and how I cope with just my pain and kind of, you know, really just allowed me to kind of find a way out. And so, uh -huh. and, you know, going through all those different challenges and, um, you know, just really dealing with like a lot of depression, but I didn't know what that was. It's just, I mean, I was just hurt, man. So, you know, mm. I was a kid that I was very precocious and I had such a very uh, broad understanding as a kid. I understood, you know, the dynamic of my parents' marriage, you know, as my, as my dad was a pastor, my mom was a first lady. So I understood the responsibility yeah that we had on people in the church and how they viewed us and looked up to us. But then there was, there was this reality that, you know, our home life was totally different from our life at church. And so for me, that just really took a, a real, uh, um, just, it, it was a weight on me as a kid. 
to try mm. to uphold this um, standard of perfection and this standard that we were, you know, the, the, the perfect family, you know, um, three beautiful children and a beautiful couple. But, you know, Monday through Saturday, it, it, it was a nightmare. So, wow. uh, but that's just to kind of give a little upbringing, I mean, um, a little backstory to just kind of like my upbringing. But fast forward to how I got involved in mental health and, and got involved into wanting to be a therapist, uh, you know, seeking help for my depression and seeking help from just dealing with suicide ideation and overcoming, you know, uh, two suicide attempts. Uh, for me, I just felt like, um, you know, even in the sports arena, there were not black male therapists. Uh, that's still not today. Um, you know, the mental health field is a very female uh, dominant uh, uh, field. Um, there's not a lot of men that uh, that are invested into mental health as it pertains to getting the education and going through the process because it is a very uh, stringent process, you know, with the intern hours, uh, with the case studies, um, with a lot of understanding the theory. It's a lot of work, but for me, I felt that it was more of my purpose. Uh, I felt it was more of my calling because there was a level of understanding that I had from a theoretical perspective, but also from a spiritual and a practical standpoint as well. So I felt like, you know, here I was, you know, a three a three dimensional individual that was that was able to understand theories, methods, but also being able to relate just, you know, through life experiences. And so um uh, and here I am today, you know, uh, yes. you know, Amazing. healed and uh, still healing. And because uh, I feel that healing is a journey and wholeness is the destination and healing is constant. It is a day to day or should I say a daily choice, you know. And so uh, and I'm just blessed to be a black male therapist, and especially during this time with so much going on. Yes. Oh, my goodness. that That's amazing, because one thing I know for sure is I help women heal through the devastation of infidelity. Like I help women, I, that's, my, that's my passion because I committed adultery years and years ago and it destroyed my family and another family. And I just went on a journey, like you said, about your parents being divorced. The things that affect us the most usually have are attached to our purpose. And the one thing that women said to me and that I like about you is they said, I went to a lot of different therapists. I tried a lot of healing. And the reason why I connect with you is because You've lived it. You've experienced adultery. You've been right. on a lot of the fence where you've been an offender and you've been offended. You got you're with a cheater and got cheated on. So for you to even be transparent and say you had two attempts of suicide and depression, it's so much easier for a man to relate to you. So my first question is, should all black men consider therapy? Absolutely. Absolutely. All black men should consider therapy. Uh because uh there's uh there's such a great deal of trauma that we already have uh, attached and associated with just being black. I mean, you think about, you know, um, the post-traumatic or uh, uh, slave syndrome, and then you think about post-traumatic stress um, disorder that we yeah. all deal with in some way, you know, coming from a broken family, coming from a dysfunctional family, coming from a very uh, unstable uh, dynamic. And so I think all black men should pursue therapy not because of what's wrong, but trying to figure out, you know, how to do it right and understanding how to process. And so, uh, because many of us don't know how to process and the way that we process is very dysfunctional and very uh, unhealthy. And for many of us as men, it's very destructive. It's uh, self-destructive. And so I think all men should, should seek therapy. Ladies, I want, ladies, please get your pens out because there's something here for us to learn. We crucify men because we don't really know their back backstory. That's why I ask at the beginning of all my interviews with men to tell me a little bit about your backstory because what you told us just now makes you very human, makes me want to have grace and mercy for you because I know some things happen along your journey. And a lot of times men are not able to communicate these things. I'm sure years and years ago, you wouldn't share this like with the world. But no. going, through, going through therapy and stuff allows you to say these things. There's a lot of men that haven't gotten help. So right. I believe all black men have suffered some type, type of trauma. But for a lot of black men, you could correct me, since it wasn't as severe as the next man, they don't even recognize it. So since it wasn't molestation or, you know, since it wasn't something so huge, they don't realize that they suffer trauma. Right, right, absolutely. So well, how because do they realize that? 
How well, I think one, 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 you know, one of the things about therapy is, is, is one, it, it allows you to connect the pieces to your puzzle. Uh, and so many of us have very distorted puzzles. And because the pieces are scattered, uh, the, the, the pieces are confusing and the pieces are hard to understand because there's no one there to conceptualize those things for us. And that's what therapy allows us to do. You know, you can come into my practice and, and sit down with me and I can show you a genogram and to help you understand why your current or present behaviors are um, impacted by your past or by your family dynamics, by your mom's behavior and by the treatment that the grandma, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, exhibited before her and so on and so forth. And so that's the beautiful thing about therapy is that we all have an internal map is that we call it. There's an internal map that we use to help you to understand why do you respond this way uh, when certain things are said or when certain things are happening? And one of the things that's so powerful about therapy is being able to understand your pain and response. Because wow. as we can help you to understand how do you respond to pain, it's also help us to understand how do you go into certain, um, uh, certain behaviors and certain patterns, for an example. Just to give an example of what that means. So if... Uh, if, if I ask you a question or normally it's through a worksheet that I would say, how do you respond to rejection? And you may say, when I feel rejection, I shut down. When I feel rejection, I go to alcohol. When I feel rejection, I turn to porn. So these are the things that we're doing to helping you to understand how your pain is sort of uh, pushing you to respond in this manner. And so as you develop the better coping skills, it allows you to have a greater understanding of the pain that exists or that we call what is the pre-existing uh, pre or uh, the presenting issue. It also allows us to help you rewire and reprogram so you can undo and unlearn what you've been doing. And now we can help you create new patterns to where when I do feel rejection, I'm able to process to say, is this person rejecting me or am I associating a past experience with what I feel in this moment that may Whoa. not be true? Whoa. Whoa. So Whoa. I hope y'all taking notes because I mean, this is helping me right now because really we're all just learning as we go along daily because we are basically, and I believe this, living our lives based on past experiences. And this is why I learned not to get advice from everybody because most people that you ask for advice, if they're not a professional, they're giving you advice based on their past experience. Right, and it's, right. it's not right for what's going on. So I'm glad I learned right. that. Are black men emotionally unfit? A lot of, uh, we won't say all, but in, we just talking on a broad spectrum right here for black people, black men who are listening. Not all, but are some black men emotionally unfit to handle committed relationships? I, I think, you know, the majority of the black men are unfit um, to be in com committed relationship and, and not because they can't, it's because they don't know how. And because for many of us as black men, and I know for myself, you know, I watched my father, you know, uh, uh, shut down often with my mom. I, I can vividly still see her asking questions like, what, what's wrong? What's going on? Why, why are you not coming home? Why are you, and you know, him just looking at her and just not saying anything. I don't know. Mm. And so I think for many black men, right, they never, you know, he, 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 here's the dichotomy in all of this, right? And this is often, you know, the, the challenge or the conundrum in this is because, you know, for so long when a man was vulnerable and when a man was open about how he felt, then there were times where he was ridiculed and he felt that this wasn't a safe space because he felt that his masculinity was being challenged. And he also felt that he was not seen as being a man because he was being, you know, uh, uh, you know, a weak dude, or he was just, you know, oh, this dude here, he in his feelings. And so what happened was, is this sent confusing messages to men because now women are asking men to be open and to be vulnerable, but well, I'm confused because on one end of the spectrum, when I tried that, you went out and said, oh, this nigga and his feelings, or he, right, you know what I'm right. saying, you know what I mean? So now all of a sudden it's like, oh, tell me how you feel. How, Sway? Because to me, and, and what, what has happened is that 
we have created such a very uh, 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 a, a very distant, you know what I'm saying, environment for men to be vulnerable to where they don't want to be in touch with their emotions. And the only way that you can be connected to a woman is you have to be connected to your own inner emotions because well, women yeah. are emotional beings. Women are emotional driven first. Men are logic. So we both need each other because as you are emotionally driven, you need a balance of logic. As I am logical, I need a balance of being able to understand how to feel. So how God created us, right? He created us in spaces to where we don't operate and function the same. However, our functions are similar. Right. If that makes right. sense. Yes. So That's in that sense, God did not make us the same. So therefore we need each other. So mm. in that space that I need to feel like this is a safe space in order for me to be vulnerable because my emotions are my prized possession. Because when a man opens up, he's laying it all on the line. For, wow. you know, it's just for the women. He's, because it's not something that we do often. Because what we fear as men is being emotional black male. And so what I mean about that is that I've shared some things with you. I shared that I was molested. I shared that my dad beat me. I shared that my mom, you know what I'm saying, treated me like I was the worst child in the world. I shared with you that these things happened to me through the family. And then when I fall short of your expectation, you did weaponize those things that I shared with you. Wow. And for us as men, when things that we share are used against us, again, we all, both men and women, have egos. Yes. So, ladies, that does attack our ego. That's just what it is. Yeah. Because now I'm just kind of like, dang. I, right. shared, I shared this with you, and now you, you know, you're using it against me. But, you know, when you look at even from, uh, uh, from the media aspect, think about, you know, there's been times, like, there's been time I've counseled many men and, you know, the story that they've shared, like, yo, man, I told her something happened to me when I was a kid. And when we got into an argument, she was like, yo, that's why he touched you. That's why, you know, this oh. dude, I, and, and that part right there is what has driven men to not tap into their emotions. And that's why you have a lot of men today who can give you the physical parts of them but cannot give you the emotional part of them. Mm. I, I really listen because I spoke to a guy one time and I was like, cause I speak to men and they share with me, like I'm one of the boys. And he said to me, he said, and I said, why, why would you tell me this? Why can't you talk to your woman like this? Cause I was saying, you know, women always tell me that men don't talk to them. He said, because like you said, if I talk to you, there's no consequences to my actions. But if, if I tell my girl the truth, I said, why don't men tell women the truth? He said, if I talk to you and tell you the truth, there's no consequences to my actions, Trey. But if I go home and, I, and my girl or my wife asks me a question and asks me to tell the truth when I tell the truth, if she don't like my truth, there'll be consequences to my actions. She won't cook. She won't sleep with me. She'll be yep. around the house stomping. So ladies, we got to learn that. If you want the truth, you got to be able to handle the truth in a healthy way. Like you said, the way that we, it's not only the men who don't know how to process because we too, on the other hand, have been taught to react. Like you telling me the truth, you looked at another woman and instead of us saying, okay, let's figure out what this problem is in our relationship, we quick to say, don't sleep over there. Don't touch me. So we got to learn ladies, like Jay said, we can't use their vulnerability and their truth against them and expect them to tell us the truth. And on the other hand, to some of the women now who are dealing with a man who can't, Jay just opened up a door for you to have this conversation with your man because somebody, everybody has somebody before us. Right, I, I, absolutely. The way that they behave. So how do we break that cycle of, I'm not her, Jay. The, your last girl, if she went off and was yelling and screaming and burned your clothes when y'all broke up, I'm not her. So how do we get men to break that cycle? Because we're dealing with some stuff too as women because of past experiences with other women. Right. I think it's important for, and you know, one of the things is, is that um, a lot of guys uh, here in Dallas, I just started on Saturday, a four week series uh, for counseling for men in the Oak Cliff community. And uh, one of the brothers said, he says, man, you know, for me, it's just, you know, 
let me see where you've been hurt. You know, let me hear your story. And one of the brothers said to me, he says, man, he said, the reason why we're able to open up to you on the first time of meeting you is because you open up to us. And so many times, not all, but there's a lot of women that are afraid to really share certain parts of them. However, they have an expectation for you to share certain parts of you. You cannot work. I mean, it, there has to be reciprocity that the only way that I feel comfortable to share is that you got to show me your wounds too. And right. you got to show me your scars because I have to feel that we both have equal, uh, it, it has to be an equal amount that we have to lose or be willing to lose in order to become naked. And what I mean by become naked is to become right. vulnerable with one another. So it can't be I'm sharing all and you just sitting here listening. You know what I mean? Right. Because for, to yeah. us, it feels like, it feels like, you know what I'm saying, you're recording this for, you know what I'm saying, to use it against me, or it can feel like interrogation. You're asking me all these questions. How many women you been with? What was your last relationship like? You know what I'm saying? What do you right. do with this? And what do you do with that? And for us as men, it kind of makes us like, oh man, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, then when you feel cornered as a man, it's just like if you were to corner an animal. That animal is going to do whatever it can to get out of that corner. So if, if you corner anybody, if you corner a woman, you know what I'm saying, you're going to come out fighting. And I'm not talking yeah. about physical fight. You're going to come yeah. out trying to defend yourself because you feel like, man, I have to go on a defense. So I think the only way to break that cycle is you have to create a space where we both can feel comfortable in just communicating and sharing to where I don't feel as if, you know what I'm saying, this is an unsafe and an untrusted space. Because I said on Saturday to the men, I said, brothers, y'all correct me if I'm wrong. And we had every age group and every generation represented there. We had men from the age of 20 all the way up to 55. And I said, brothers, I've been using this quote. It's a revelation that I had. And I said, if I'm wrong, you guys correct me. I said, a man will open up to a woman he trusts and he will talk to a man he respect. And I just, just set that there. And the man said, dude, that's it. Wow. There's a trust factor. And ladies, trust does not look the same for us as it does for you. Right. It does not. Because see, you don't get trust until you have conflict, for one. I don't know I can trust you until there's conflict. And I'm not talking about an argument. Right. I'm talking about conflict to where we don't see eye to eye on some things. We're not in agreement because that's going to tell me where your heart is. That's going to tell me where your thoughts are. Because see, when people are upset, that's why I tell people, you have to be emotional, intelligent, and not everyone is emotional, intelligent. Their IQ emotionally is not the highest. And so when people are upset, you find out how people really feel. You find out what is the driver in their decisions. Because Ooh. when you don't get your way, what do you say? When Ooh. you don't get what you want, what do you say? Those things matter. So being able to process even in a space where I didn't hear what I wanted to hear, but let me be mature enough to embrace his truth whatever that is. Right. That's how you break the cycle. Because what if he did? And Because again, I deal with men from all walks of life. What if he comes out and says that I was with a man? Oh. Again, and it wasn't oh. by choice. It was by something that happened when I was young. Mm -hmm. So, in that space, are you listening to say, oh, nigga, you gay, or this and that, again. And, right. I, and, I'm, and I'm sharing these stories because, again, listening to understand, not respond, to say, okay, man, wow, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's heavy. Yeah. And then leaning in to that space mm. to gain understanding of how it made him feel and wow. not trying to make him feel embarrassed or shame or have the guilt that someone, some man, some boy took advantage of your innocence and exploited that. Wow. So when I tell you there are so many black men 
that are walking around with sexual trauma and yes. abuse. Mm. Because many of us grew up in families where we didn't talk about the family secrets. That's right. Many women are walking around with sexual trauma and abuse because we didn't talk about what Uncle Joe did. Yes. Everybody knew he had an issue, but we swept it under the rug. Mm. So right. now, here's what happens. You have a lot, here's what you have, T. Our generation were a generation of a lot of wounded kids that are scarred adults. Woo! That's a whole segment. Mm. Woo! Wounded kids become scarred adults. Mm. And that's where we are right now. And mm. that's why therapy, counseling, coaching is necessary for both. I encourage people, and, I, and, and, and this is something I've said, especially since I've been practicing and been on my journey, I'm not dating anybody that don't have a therapist or a counselor. I'm not doing it. I know that's right. I ain't even because and 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 not because again you have got because again you said it early. We all come with stuff, but I want to know how you process it and unpacking through your stuff because you can't unpack on unpack on me, and I don't want to unpack on you, right? Because I don't want to bring in the dysfunctional patterns that are attached to my childhood experiences and trauma, and then that become prevalent in our relationship. Right. That when there's an issue, I can't talk to you because it's not you. It's really because mama and daddy didn't validate me. Right. Then right. all of a sudden, I can't talk to you, but I'm on Instagram and I'm hopping in somebody's DM trying to start another situation. You, you wow. see what I'm saying? Yep. Because again, Cheating is a symptom. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Self-medicating, alcohol, pornography, drug use, these are all symptoms. These are not the presenting issue. It's like, even when I'm working with couples, I'm often saying like, okay, I know he cheated, I know she cheated, but that's not the issue, baby girl. Right. The, that's a symptom. So let's look at the underlying issue. What is the issue that pushes that individual to go here or there? Now, and here's the other part of that. Whether, whether you are being cheated on or you are the cheater, we both play a role in that. I always say that, yes. You both play a role in that. Because when you bring people together, you know, you think about, let's say you, you know, you, you, you 40 and this other person is 40 and, and you guys are coming together trying to build a family and neither one of you have never processed. You are combining 80 years of trauma. Wow. 80 years of trauma. Mm. Wow. And I say that to a lot of the, the women that I work with. I say to them, a man can never blame you for deciding to cheat and stick his penis in another woman. So I don't want you to carry that burden. But you have to be responsible for the breakdown of the relationship. Because there was a breakdown long before the sex. There was a breakdown long before the drug addiction. There was a breakdown long before the porn. You don't have to be accountable for his behavior, but you have to look, or you're going to take this to the next relationship with you. And, yeah. and let me ask you this. A lot of men, like you said, you saw your dad shut down on your mother. And I hear this from a lot of women, men not communicating, you know, just you ask them a question, they sit there like a deer in headlights or like, I'm just not going to answer that question. Are, are too many women ignoring and a, a major problem as not to make the decision to walk away. So you got this man that don't communicate and you you tired of it, but are we um, adding to the problem or are we condoning his behavior by just staying too long? Because how does a person change? And I tell women, nothing changes if nothing changes. If he don't communicate every time he walk away, you just next week, y'all go back to everything being normal. Are we a contributing factor to the problem? Uh Let's see, that, that's a, a two parts to that. Number one, I don't think that women are a, uh, are contributors to, uh, uh, contributors to the problem. However, I think there was a problem there before you guys engaged or made a commitment. And this is why it's important to see where are people at in their lives 
in their walk, on their journey. This is why it's so important to have those conversations, like to ask someone, okay, when you get into an argument, when you are mad, what do you do? Those right. questions are important. You know what I'm saying? To find out what are the uh, patterns of people's behavior when there is conflict. Do you shut down? Do you walk away? You know what I'm saying? And being able to articulate that and being able to convey that to your partner gives them an understanding of how they need to have how they need to handle that. What are your triggers? But see, you can't you can't get an understanding of you until you go sit down and deal with you. And you can't deal with you by yourself. You're gonna have to go somewhere that's gonna show you you from a different perspective. And that's what therapy does, is to show you you from a different perspective. I'm not talking about the you that you only look in the mirror when you made up. I'm not talking about the you that you only look in the mirror when you got your clothes on. Because there's a lot of people won't stand in the mirror and look at themselves naked. And I mean physically and yeah. metaphorically that there's a lot of people who won't look at their stuff and like and say, hey, I need to do work. So in that case, I would ask the woman, what is the desired outcome that you want from this relationship? And what is it that you want from this man? Because it is very difficult and very challenging and very mentally and emotionally exhausting to try to get somebody to deal with their stuff when they don't see that they have stuff that is going on within them. Wow. It's very difficult. So the woman have to ask herself, what is it that you want from this? Do you want a changed man? Do you want a better relationship? What is the outcome? Right. Because see, I have to be able, it's like therapy. We said, I, I determine what the outcome, or should I say, I ask the client, for one, what is the goal versus what is the outcome? Because right. you can't have one without the other. Because the outcome, for an example, if the outcome is that I want a better relationship, then the goal is that I want Terry to start talking. If Terry starts talking and starts open up, the outcome is that we have a better relationship. So you got to know outcome versus goal and, 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 and goal versus outcome. If you're not clear on that, you're spinning your wheels. And what happened is, is we call this a circulatory cycle to where the more you pursue him, he withdraws. And the more he withdraws, the more you go after him. So it becomes a figure eight and it becomes a cycle. And eventually it just dismantled because, you know what I'm saying? You both are just mentally and physically tired from this game. So it has to be, to, it has to come to a point is what is it that you want? And so if you're dealing with somebody that you guys are already starting out having a difficulty, you know, having communication or uh, uh, conversing and talking about certain things, you need to reevaluate that. Right. Because at this point, I'm not begging nobody. What's wrong? Talk to right. me, Sheila. What's right? You know what I mean? All this stuff. Like, because nine times out of ten, I can tell you this, T, it ain't your stuff. Right. It ain't your stuff. And so for you to be up begging and asking a grown man to talk like, man, I'm not doing it, or asking a, a, a woman to talk to open up like, man, people got to deal with their stuff, man. And, you know, I'm so glad that mental health is starting to, 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 to really take off, you know, and, and, and really beginning to, you know, uh, 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 become the way for Blacks because we have just a lot of dysfunctional way of living and, and patterns just within our own communities and, and and because of the systemic racism and oppression because the black man was removed from the home the, the black woman had to become the provider she had to become you know what i'm saying the protector so she had to become all of these things so women raise boys you know what i'm saying to to be you know well i'm gonna spoil you and then you raise your girls to be strong women and now that these strong women are grown and all the women, men are emotionally and mentally you know what I'm saying? Crippled. I'm raising my hand because I had to really correct myself. I have a 25-year-old son, a 20-year-old son, and an 11-year-old son. And my 25-year-old, like, we just had a, a real bad conflict, me and him. And we never really get to a point where I'm just like, yo, like, I ain't even speaking to you right now. I, I'm never that because my kids mean so much to me. But he's, I spoiled him so bad. Like, but I, I didn't know. Because of the choices I made, I was operating out of guilt. 
So I spoiled him so bad that he got this sense of entitlement. Now you're going to turn on me? I was like, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. And then I had to think to myself, you created this. This, 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 you created this. So you got to figure out how to get us back on track or to pull yourself away from the situation. So he has an opportunity to see himself and that you are not going to ex accept or expect disrespect from him. So, and I had to look at myself a lot of times and I had to really say, I got to get out of the guilty realm because I've already apologized to him for the things, but that was my journey. And our parents, like, that's a whole nother story. I love my mom. My mom has some really heavy baggage at my dad, but I always was like, you know what? That's their stuff. So I'm trying right. to, you know, like, you can't be a failure or you can't use me. You can't use my stuff as your baggage because that ain't right. Work. Right, exactly. No, no, said, that's right. I hope that the moms are taking notes because we're raising somebody's husband. And, and that's a scary thing, especially for a single mother. So we have to seek people like you. We have to seek mentors. And we've been taught, like you said, to be the strong. I'm not, I don't need nobody. I can raise a man. I've learned on my journey, and I tell so many mothers, you can't raise a man without a man. And it's no. that whole man. No. Because we don't have, we don't operate the same. So that was so good. Our time is running out. So let me get the questions that I really want. Um, so how do we recognize, what are some of the signs families and friends should look for as far as depression in black men? Uh, you should look for the disassociation. And um, what I mean about disassociation is just to see, you know, if they uh, become distance, uh, become withdrawn, uh, they become silent. Um, if you notice that, uh, you know, his accountants uh, has, it, it, it has shifted and sort of, you know, kind of, you know, their expression is, is, is more of a sad because a lot of men try to, you know, we, we try to hide that because we, we don't want anyone to know, you know what I'm saying, that we're dealing with something. And so uh, I, I encourage people to really pay attention to those signs, you know, pay attention to, you know, how they're behaving, you know, are they, uh, um, are they very passive? Are they very negative? You know, are they very pessimistic? You know, are, you know, everything is, uh, what could go wrong? You know, what isn't right? You know what I mean? Those things. And so that's just kind of to simplify it and to, you know, to kind of make it, you know, uh, 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 simple for people to understand some of the things that, you know, uh, that, that are visible, uh, with men, when you see men start falling in depression and for the spouses, you know, pay attention to his sleep pattern. You know, uh, is he sleeping through the night? You know, if he's not sleeping through the night, is he sleeping a lot? So there's a, so many different, you know what I'm saying, symptoms. And that's the thing too, you know, there's a huge difference. And, you know, when clients come in and they talk about depression, it's like, you know, I always give uh, the scale to where, are you depressed or are you feeling sad? Because sad, feelings of sadness and depression are two different things because depression is associated with symptoms and feelings of sadness is associated with an actual event. It's something that took place. Wow, wait a minute, say that one more time so people who are listening can really get that. Yeah, so uh, the, the difference is, is that there's a difference between being depressed and feeling sad because depression is associated with symptoms and feelings of sadness is associated with an actual event or something that took place in your life that has caused your feelings to shift. So that's that's the difference. That is way powerful. That that now that's powerful. I'm so glad you're here because if you just tuned in, you're tuned in to hashtag coffee with tea and I'm T and this is Man Combo Monday, my series Men Hurt Too, where I bring men on to share their truth and share their experience and their expertise in areas of being a black man. Because who better to ask about being a black man than a black man? And this is on this platform, this is not a debate for us to debate back and forth with men, but to listen to them and get the golden nuggets and the truth. So I want to, there was this guy, right? And these are scenarios where I want women to understand that guys have trauma that leads to behavior. So there was a guy I knew and he used to always say, um, he used to always refer to all women as these bitches, right? And he was a good friend of mine. We was cool. And he was always saying, not you, not you. So I had a conversation with him one time. So I'm like, why you always say that? Like, I don't like that. He was like, but I ain't talking about you. I said, well, who are you talking about? He said, back in high school, 
And something clicked in my head to say back in high school, he had the girl, he wasn't popular. All the girls, he said all girls wanted to deal with the, the bad boys and the a-holes. And I'm like, oh, like he's still carrying that from ninth grade. Like, yo, is this, are you really? And then there's another, one of my ex-boyfriends, he used to always say to me, all you women, all you women. And it's like saying you people. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, all you women, that's associated with your experiences. And he had bad experiences with his mother. And there was another guy I knew who went to the prom and couldn't get a limo, had to go in, in his father's car. And now he has all these fancy cars. Like, it's never enough cars. Are these the symptoms that we're dealing with when we deal with these men? Well, that comes from, uh, they're not symptoms. What they're called are cognitive distortions. And so okay. cognitive, cognitive distortions in our field is basically when an individual perceives their reality inaccurately based off of a certain experience. And one of the distortions is overgeneralizing to where you associate one experience all with you associate an experience to be the same as your previous experience it's kind of like what you're saying is what has happened to where cognitively they have been distorted through their pattern of thinking to where the experience that i had in high school that all women were considered bees or because of i wasn't chose now i see all women to be that because of the treatment that i had this is why you know therapy is is important because you know, uh, it happens even to where we begin to become dismissive, e even in our emotions. Uh, we begin to, um, one of those is like, we become a fortune teller to where, well, I know, you ever heard somebody, well, I already know how this going to end. You know, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen this type of man before. So these are all cognitive distortions. And so it's about, it's probably about 15 uh, cognitive distortions. And so if we had time, I would, you know, kind of list them all. But uh, and one of the distortion is uh, just kind of give people, you know, some. Uh, let me pull it up here so people have some understanding. So one, of, so so one of them is called polarized thinking, and polarized thinking to where you don't see no gray. Everything is black and white. Right. Everything is black and white. There's no gray. And I'll be honest with you. You know, the reality of his, of life is that they're always going to be gray. And one of the things is that, uh, that I see a very common distortion is emotional reason. You know what I'm saying? Believing that, well, my feelings are true. Because sometimes you can feel things that may be real, but there's no accuracy on it. It's right. almost like people who struggle with anxiety, right? Anxiety comes from the fear of the what if. What if they don't like me? What if right. I'm not good enough? What if I'm not pretty enough? What if I don't have enough education? And then you begin to feel this feeling and you be, have this emotional reason that, hey, this must be true because I don't have my master. So it must be true that they're not hiring people. So it's, it, it's so much. This is why me personally, like when, it, when I was in grad school, it was, um, it, it was like the most beautiful journey because I was just a, a, a sponge. But right. everything made sense to me when you begin to connect the dots theoretically and to understand like, dang, this is why you have somebody who he didn't heal from not being enough. And the fact that I missed my moment when I went to prom and I had to take this old car. And now that I have all of these cars, I overcompensate for what I didn't address that it was not the fact that it was an old car. It was the fact that in that moment, I did not feel that right. I was enough or feel that I was the guy. So now I have to show you, this is who I am. I've made it. So wow. all of those are cognitive distortions. Wow, we gotta, we gotta talk again. Cause this, I'm sure every, listen, y'all better, better get a session. I like sign up for a session. Cause we <laughs> all, I'm big on coaching. Uh, D Marshall is my coach. I'm big on coaching. I'm big on therapy. So I'm like, cause I do a lot of work on myself like every day. Cause like you said, for me, I tell, I say healing is a process. Somebody's going to do something to offend me probably on a daily basis. And when you know that you're really on a journey of healing, you don't get offended as fast or you'll, you'll let it go as fast, you know, faster than you normally would. Right. This is how you calculate and that I was changing because, you know, before somebody, in, you know, the, the cashier say something to me, I'm like, 
you want this smoke? Like, you know, what I, but now it's like, right. you having a bad day or. Right, has, exactly. So well, yeah, because, yeah, because now you're able to, and it's just, it's just like rejection. It's all perception. Right. Rejection, rejection is a perception, just like offense. And then I'm like, I'll ask the client, like, it's, it's, it's like, are you offended? Or is it something that you didn't like about what was said? Right. Because what, because what is offense really? Right. You know what I mean? So did what this individual said, did it harm you? Did it change your, uh, uh, your, your work status? Did it change, you know what I'm saying? Your health status? Like, right. were you really offended? Or did you not, or did you not like what was said? So it's being able to separate the two. It's being able to separate how you felt from the individual. Right. That's what really I, what. What I learned too is, I look at myself now. Like even when I see a post that might jar me, that it ain't even. It's not even toward me. They weren't even talking to me. I just happened to click on somebody's post and I felt some kind of way. I'm like, I have to tell myself, what is that all about? Like that person ain't even talking to you. And I see so many people like on on my post, like going hard. Like I have a movement called hashtag No Side Chicken, where I encourage women to honor, guard, and respect each other's relationship to not sleep with each other's men, so we can, so things can turn around. And I see so many women arguing back and forth. I'm like, what would you argue back and forth if I'm saying hashtag no side chicken, don't sleep with somebody's man? Why did that hit you so hard? Why, why are you so offended? Because that's something you need to deal with. So that's another part of my healing. When I see something that offends me and it's not even toward me, I'm like, wait a minute, that hit you. There's an yeah. area there that you're sensitive because it made you feel some kind of way. Yeah. So my next question and probably my last question, because we're almost to 10 o'clock. How do we introduce black men to therapy, also known as help, without them being offended? Because I've said to a couple of men I know, just out of, you know, just because I think therapy is good. I think coaching is good. I try to introduce them to coaching, which can lead to therapy. Because, you know, coaching, it sounds like a football term, maybe, or basketball. Right, and they right. like, you need therapy. Like, why would you even right. ask me? And I'm like, whoa, brother, it's okay. You don't have to. Yeah. I'm just thing so how do we introduce them without making yeah i mean you know you know that that you know there's a stigma attached to it um and i think you know when when god spoke to me you know four years ago uh to go back to school and um and to pursue becoming a therapist because i was already doing mentoring and i was doing emotional um uh i had an emotional recovery program for uh boys and girls in group homes down in houston and so for me i was kind of already working within that uh, uh, feel, but then I wanted to to add, you know, the real understanding of understanding, like, you know, how do you begin to help people who need a solution focus, you know what I'm saying, type of uh, protocol, people who need a narrative approach, people who need a collective approach, and, and for me, my theory that I work from is from a, a structural uh, 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 perspective, and from a structural model is that what I do is I take patterns, and I manipulate them patterns, and I help insert new patterns in order to change the system. So for an example, is that if a family comes to me because their kid is acting out, what I do is I don't center the kid as being the problem of the family. There's a problem within the family that is causing the kid to act out. So everybody has to be involved in that process. So there are times when I, because if the kid feels like he's a problem, guess what the kid is gonna do during that time of intervention? He's gonna shut down. Everybody plays a role. It's just like when you have a kid that has autism. Like I work with families that have kids on the end of the spectrum of autism. The kid, the kid, the autistic kid, he's the expert. Why is he the expert? Because he came to you with this issue. So you have to adjust to him. So understanding that is that we have to teach. And sometimes teaching is not through just talking. Sometimes teaching is just through presenting. It's just through suggesting because I tell my clients, I'm not here to fix you. I make suggestions. I create a treatment plan. However, you are the sole provider in this process, meaning that you're going to have to provide the healing through uh, uh, um, applying these skills and applying these different methods. And so for black men, I think one, I'm so blessed that God has chosen me and put this on my life. We got to see black men as therapists. We got to see black men, like for, for the reason where my online is called kjbcoaching.com. 
And I was strategic with that because as you said, even though I'm a therapist, but then I went and, and, and became a coach, a mental health coach, because coaching takes on a different connotation if I hear that. Yeah. So that allows a man to kind of feel like, oh, okay, because again, we all have our reasons why we perceive and interpret words to be certain things because even words means a thing even in therapy. So yes. for men, it's being able to see men have safe spaces. Um, that's why I'm blessed. I have a lot of opportunities ahead of me for TV to, to start helping men on TV. So the more men, black men see that, it's going to help us to become open because if we don't see it, it's not going to do it. And when I became... Uh, a therapist and started working with men. So many men reach out to me on, on Instagram when I'm sharing my videos because what they said is like, bro, I, I respect you. And just to see you open up and being vulnerable, okay, that means I can do it. And that's how we are as men. I mean, you think about it, even from a sports place, right? Michael Jordan would have never jumped from the free throw line had Dr. J never did it. So what right. am I saying? We got to see it first. Wow. We got to see it first. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this time. And my 11-year-old is on the autism spectrum. He's nonverbal, and but he's very verbal, body language. Like, he's yeah, so... Very, yeah, very, yeah. I say to him, you're the loudest person in the room. For somebody that can't talk, you are the loudest person in the room because his body language. I'm like, yo, go sit down. Like, stop. And people, they'll look at me like, he has autism. I'm like, it's okay. But yeah. like... We had to readjust to him. Yeah, to and him. He, he's not adjusting to us. He's like, nope. who I am. And I wish a lot of people could experience a, a child or a person on the spectrum for one year. Because for one he, year. He would act. He just honest. <laughs> he ain't yep. putting up airs, And he just real. So we got to really adjust to the people around and not saying excuse people's poor behavior before people start emailing us, inboxing us saying you have to adjust to certain situations in a different way. Yeah, yeah. You have to, I mean, I have a niece that's on the spectrum, man. So, you know, of autism. So, you know, um, and I mean, again, they came to you like that. So yeah. they're teaching you how to adjust to who they are. So, uh, you know, I mean, and it's one of those things where, um, you know, I've, I've worked with several kids on the spectrum and, and some of the most intelligent kids, if not the brightest that I've ever seen, because yes. their mind is just wired differently. And they just see the light, uh, they see colors, you know what I'm saying, from a different lens and it's beautiful. And so I, I think it's dope that, you know, they, actually I might, like, God gave them this gift, right? And again, what people understand, I'm not talking about the gift because I don't see it as a disorder. And as I tell all of my clients is that what you are challenged with is a challenge. It is not a disorder because I do not want you. Now, is it labeled in the DSMB as a, as a disorder so I can understand the symptoms and understand how to create a treatment plan? Absolutely. However, I do not want you to take this label because what I am teaching my niece is that you are challenged with autism. This right. does not mean that you are this. Yes. So at any time, if you are given the proper skills, we love you and support you. Guess what? You can live a successful, blissful, and happy life. Yes. And I want everybody to hear one thing that you just said. When we encounter people, just like our children with autism, they came to you like that. Absolutely. Everybody came to you with a certain amount of trauma from growing up to experiences they've had. So we have to have grace and mercy on everybody and especially our Absolutely. black men. I promise you, I'm a black, I'm an advocate for black men, have been for a long time. And I'm not glad that George Floyd is dead. I'm not glad that these things are happening to black men, but I'm glad now because so many people are saying black, black, black men, black lives matter, black men are this and black men are that. It took a catastrophe. Yep. And I it's for a long time like listen I, wrote, I have a book it's healing time men hurt too that I, I published two years ago and I'm like get this book black men need help and nobody's listening and so I'm glad that it's on a rise right now because black men are our leaders we yep. need them at home we need them leading in corporations society is teaching us that women we can't be leaders and have a black man be a leader in the home with us we can work side by side but we expect black men to do certain things and we take away their ability to lead. Like we'll walk ahead and open the door ourselves, and then feel some kind of way because he didn't open the door. 
well, you didn't give him a chance to. And I had to check myself on some things. I'm like, why he don't open the door? But I'm five steps ahead of him before he even get there to open the door. And then when I slowed down, I noticed he opened the door. So we got to like give our black men, again, the ability to lead, the grace and mercy. And the first line in my book is men are human beings first. Yep. Because God has put on black men, even men in general, but on black men, as soon as the doctor says it's a boy, there's so many expectations. And it's like, you're not a human anymore. You're a male. And these are the things that you need to do. So tell me yeah. uh, one thing you would like to say to men who are listening in reference to therapy and just in reference to life in general, just a word of encouragement. I just want to tell men that you are valuable and that you are needed and that your healing is necessary. Your healing is necessary for the next generation. It's necessary for your family. It's necessary for your community. But more importantly, your healing is necessary for you to become the best version of yourself, black man. Love you, brother. Wow, and then just tell everybody where they can find you. So you can find me on Instagram, King J Barnett, uh, Twitter, King J Barnett, and my coaching and counseling website is kjbcoaching.com, kjbcoaching.com, where I do EAP training for small businesses and corporations. Uh, we do um, group counseling, we do individual and couple. And this is all virtual, so it's a, bit, a virtual counseling and coaching platform. That's awesome. Thank you so much, King J. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. To have you here. We got to do this again because people are asking questions, and they want to yes, know something. Some of y'all got to pay for these questions that you ask, and that's called a therapy session. This is our life. <laughs> we cannot pick our brains because would you go to work for free at your job? I don't think yeah. so. Thank you guys for tuning in today to Coffee with Tea. I will see y'all on Wednesday. I have my, gay, my guest, Nadine Abu Bakr, who is the founder of Nasan's Place, which is a wonderful nonprofit for autism families. She is our Wonder Woman Wednesday, and she's going to give you some resources and to talk about her journey. So tune in on Wednesday. Remember what I tell you at the end of all my broadcasts. You deserve the best. Yes, I'm talking to you. You deserve the best. Now go get it. Peace and blessings. And remember Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. I'll see you guys on Wednesday for Coffee with Tea. And that's me. Peace. Thank you, Jay. Thank you.